in this method of teaching, you can't pick and choose. The assumption is you don't know what's worthwhile. And this method of teaching truly, right? It's nice to talk about this pretty, but this method of teaching can be profoundly dangerous. You can't just say, I'm here for the waza, if you're following this model. You may get better at whatever it is you're interested in getting better at, no doubt about it. You may become expert at something. But this model is, I used the term earlier, you got to be infected. And oh, I've been spitting out the bones from for 30 years. We can have this Shuhadi dialogue and it sounds real cool and stuff, but if one is actually living this, you do, it's a great metaphor, you do swallow the whole fish and some of them get yep. stuck in your throat and some of them may never get out. Okay, everybody, welcome to the Integral Dojo series of community calls on the Shu Ha Li Dialogues. My name is Miles Kessler, I'm the director of the Integral Dojo, and today I'm joined with Ellis M. Durasensei, and we're going to be having a, um, today's call is going to be kind of a discussion with the two of us, going to be spotlighting more on Ellis's um, uh, view of Shu Ha Li. And towards the end of the call, we will leave some space for q and It's probably 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes. And if anybody has any questions, uh, then you're, we'll, we'll kind of invite you to come in. You can either write them in the chat or bring them into uh, uh, live. We'll open up your mic. So before I get started, let me just, uh, Ellis, I'll read a quick introduction of bio for you and then, uh, and then we'll get started. So Ellis M. Sensei is a licensed instructor in two koryu, uh, classical Japanese martial arts. Uh, the Araki Ryu and Todaha Buko Ryu, systems of Koryu, of traditional martial arts. Uh, he is a psychotherapist. Is that correct? Did I get that right? Psychotherapist? Yes, he's a psychotherapist, a certified counselor, and a state certified child mental specialist. Ella, Ella Sensei is a prolific author and public speaker and has written both fiction and nonfiction with some 20 plus books on both martial arts and crisis intervention, including Dueling with O Sensei and Hidden in Plain Sight. I'm very happy to be welcoming uh, Ella Sensei. Welcome to, the, to our series, Ellis. Good morning over here. <laughs> yeah, all right. Good morning to you. And um, so, yeah, so we're speaking about Shuhari, and I thought maybe um, there may be some people on the call that, that have either a, a little understanding of what Shuhari is or maybe just a very um, uh, or no understanding of it at all. Um, maybe you could just give from your point of view and then my point of view, we'll just give like a two minute overview of what Shuhari is for you and me, and then we'll kind of uh, go into a little bit more of a discussion about it. Um. Well, the idea of Shuhari uh, is a uh, andragogical idea. Uh, andragogical being, yeah. What is that? <laughs> so we, we talk about pedagogy, but that really means teaching children. Okay. Andragogy is teaching adults, and it's a specific Japanese concept that uh, you learn the form, then you begin adapting within the form, and allegedly you eventually transcend the form. Allegedly, okay. In, in, in a nutshell. Uh, um, and I'll, I'll go on to, j just to start with that as, as, as a, a basic concept. Great. Yeah. So, so for, for me, Shuhari was, it, it was something I, have, I was aware of while I was living in Japan, but, but from the, I, you don't hear too much about it in Aikido. There probably are teachers who are focusing on it. So if your teacher is, you know, I'm not, I'm not speaking about you, but it's not part of Aikido being a modern martial art. I, I guess it's not part of that. Um, generally speaking, it's not part of that tradition. I started hearing about it and going more into it. And then in a way over a several decades, um, not as much as Ellis Sensei, but over a few decades, um, I started to kind of see how my own practice, looking back and see how my own practice unfolded in these, straight, in, in these three stages. Shu, uh, loosely translated, means um, conformity, conforming to the forms of the system. Ha meaning uh, hanaredu or separating from what you had conformed to. So there's kind of a departure from that, or uh, I call that the application stage. And then the third stage being re, uh, transcending, going beyond, or maybe we should, if I, if I stick with Ellis, I'll say allegedly <laughs> going beyond <laughs> the form. So this is a basic overview. And I see this kind of as a step-by-step -step developmental, um, uh, uh, let's say unfolding that a student goes through in, in their own practice but there's no guarantee. 
we can get stuck at any stage as the case may be. And, um, and yeah, so that's my kind of overview of Shuhari. Um, and maybe Ellis, just before I pass it back to you, I'll just say that, that one thing that for me enc that encompasses Shuhari um, beautifully is, is a quote from Pablo Picasso. If you ever see Pablo Picasso's, um, if, you, if you go to Google and you Google early Pablo Picasso and you'll see his art, a nose is a nose, an ear is an ear, the eyes are, you know, the, it's like he was a very, very, very good classical painter. And then at some point he became Pablo Picasso and that's, that's when he reached allegedly the, the Shuhai, the Lari stage. And he says to learn the rules like a pro so you can break the rules like an artist. And that for me really beautifully encompasses what Shuhari should be. So uh, Ellis, do you, have, do you want, do you want to uh, say something from there? Or should we? Uh... Yeah. Um, well, to start with, in neither of the codium uh, that I trained was Shuhari part of the discourse. Mm -hmm. uh, the concepts were, but that particular term has whatever historical weight it has with the arts it was associated with. I read an interesting quote, which I don't remember exactly, from uh, Miyamoto Tsuzuro uh, at the Aikikai. He's an eight, currently eighth dan shihan. Mm -hmm. And apparently the quote was something like, my students keep asking me about shuhari, but they haven't practiced with enough depth to even bother me about this or talk to me. About I love it. it. I love it. I love it. That's <laughs> great. So, okay. So what does that mean to you? Well, what it means is, uh, particularly in the West, um, we very quickly feel confined by form and we feel, you know, we are almost oppressed by systems and form. You can get in almost a political discourse about it. Mm. And so um, there's this, what about me? I'm a creative soul. And uh, where's my room to shine and to make my own sort of thing. Aikido lends itself to that, particularly a lot of Aikido because uh, you see different teachers doing things different ways. Um, uh, there's many teachers are not restrictive on how their students are training. I don't know if they're not interested or, you know, that's their style of teaching. Yeah. Um, so there's this kind of inchoate practice that people do. Um, just a couple other thoughts come to mind in terms of Aikido. Uh, friend of mine, David Rubens. Uh, I know David teacher. Rubens. Good friend. Uh, good. good. <laughs> yeah, sure. so, so he's a, he's a Yoshinkai teacher in uh, right. uh, Great Britain. Yeah. And I happened to visit his dojo the day a young woman started. Mm -hmm. And so she, she was being taught the very basic movements of Yoshinkai. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to come back to basic movements a little later, but I just want to start with that. And, you know, they had, were very strict. Your foot is here. Your hips are here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And just by chance, I was there a year later. Hmm. And so was she. She had been training quite a number of days a week for a solid year. And that young lady could hit a tenkan. The movement was as precise as a machine. And her stability, her postural stability was so impeccable. Mm. And I was reflecting on the fact that you don't, honestly, the majority of people who do Aikikai training are not as precise in their tenkan. Right. Um, and they're not as stable. So to even begin to start talking about the higher stage, the hot stage, the D stage. Right. Has there been, has, have people really addressed a form to work with? One added problem I just want to mention briefly, um, and I'll give two examples. The first uh, is in fact uh, Iwama. Um, I was aware or made aware that Saito Sensei had bad hips. And bad knees, bad knees. Was, it somehow reflected in the way he twisted his hip. Towards, the end and, of the, uh, towards his later years, it did. Yeah. And I could recognize an Iwama person often across the room <laughs> by the distortion of posture they did in their hips. Yeah, sure. They were assiduously imitating the mistake. And a friend of mine was actually at a seminar mm -hmm. 
where Saito Sensei suddenly stopped and started yelling at everybody. He said, don't imitate the way I'm doing things. My body's messed up. <laughs> and uh, a similar example was Shindo Muso Ryu Jo yeah. at uh, stick fighting school. And the, I don't know how many back now, they've got their own politics, but Shimizu Takaji, the famous headmaster at that point of the school, this old man, he had very swollen legs. They looked like they were full of fluid. And he didn't pick his feet up when he walked. And he shuffled his feet, and they maybe went 30 centimeters, one foot, uh, per step, shuffled across the floor. And I saw giant brawny men imitating his footwork when they did Joe. They were moving like a somewhat incapacitated 70 plus year old man. Mm. And so a person can have wonderful intent mm. in terms of following the teacher. But then there's the question, what is this basics that you're studying? How assiduous is the teacher ensuring that you get basics that would help you really learn the art? Right. In other words, as a foundation, as from which to, to progress further along. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's, st let's stay with that because, you know, we, in, here in the West, we don't really have so much of this system, but in the old apprenticeship, like in the guilds, you know, I think that there was a similar thing. You know, a young, a young boy would go to the, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, and he would sweep the floors for a couple of years, and he was able to do a few, and then eventually he, be he would become the next master of that, of that guild or whatever. Um, but there's a, I, I see the main difference according to what you were just saying, here in the West, individuality is, individuality is quite a, a, a high value. Whereas in Japan, it's, it's looked down on, you know, wagamama. It's, it's, if you're an individual, you're being selfish. Conformity is the social um, value. And mm -hmm. it just so happens that this first stage is all about conformity. Even if your teacher has a limp, you're going to somehow in a way, uh, what he said, uh, conform to that limp, as you were saying. So maybe we just talk about this first stage sh as shoe, as conformity, but in, in the sense of preparation for the next stage. Yeah. Um, the other thing I think people don't grasp is in the traditional shuhadi model, mm -hmm. um, one, you conceive of instruction very differently. Right. Um, you... The way I put it is you have to be willing to be infected by your teacher. Mm. You think your teacher's thoughts. Totally. You adopt and sometimes struggle with your teacher's values. So, for example, um, I've been, I left Japan in 1988. I've returned, you know, uh, where I was living that time, 13 years. I've been back, but basically I left 1938. Mm -hmm. I dream about my one Araki teacher three, four times a week mm -hmm. and still being taught. And his, I was his only student for much of my time there. And one night drinking, which was every night. Sure. Together, <laughs> it's common. He, he said to me, you're a total waste of breath. He said, you came to Japan at the age of 23. You thought you had a soul of your own. If I had gotten you when you were 16, I could have made you something worthwhile. But it's too late. As long as you thought you have your own soul, what's the point? And I just, sorry, you know, and inside I'm going, yes. <laughs> You'll never get me. But so I was in, I was in this perpetual war to preserve uh, my own self right. in that circumstance. Uh, and yet, without that level of influence, uh, you do not absorb what the teacher's teaching. You may learn techniques, but to think that a, a, a true Japanese martial art is techniques, I mean, what would Aikido be without Ueshiba? you know, this omnipresent influence, this mm -hmm. infection in Aikido, positive or negative, depending on your, your point of view. Uh, uh, all the things that people struggle with in terms of uh, spirituality, conflict resolution, what did it really mean? All the et ceteras are part of Aikido, whether you buy into them or resist them. And 
to think that, oh, all I got to do is learn how to do a precise shihonage and a precise ikkyo, and then I've gotten through the, uh, the shoe stage, and then I can start adapting and doing my own ingenious variations. It's missing the whole point. Yeah, it's totally, it's, 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 it's like an ego, an ego activity to think that I can actually do it. That's not how it works. You have to live into that position and then it, then should he, whatever that is, starts to appear on its own. It's not something mm -hmm. you can plan for. Right, right. So, so, um, so, so let's talk about that because, because Shu basically, let, let's take Aikido. I'm sure it's the same thing with Koryu. But the, the forms that are in alignment with the principles, so I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about a, a, um, a, a, a form that's a pure expression of the principles. There's a lot of empty forms, there's a lot of bad forms out there. I'm not talking about anybody in particular, but let's say something where the form and the principle comes together. The beginner can't see the principle, it's invisible. What they can see is the form and they start to try to conform to the principle, but especially in Aikido, it's, it's, it's quite counterintuitive. You know, everything in my system, in my, in my, there's a certain schmuckiness that everybody walks into the dojo with at the beginning, to use a, a term of art, <laughs> that, that they have to start to, in a way, um, what do you say, um, well, conforming to the style in a way is like putting a, putting a, um, a, a regulator on your own egoic tendencies. So what it, can we speak about, um, Shu, the value of doing that, the value of conforming at this stage of development? Yeah. Well, you know, Aikido, uh, and by the way, for those of you who don't know, I, I do have this kind of odd involvement with Aikido. I was very intensely training for some years, and I have this kind of weird consultant role. Uh, that's the best way to put it. I, I, I'm invited to teach at Aikido dojos. I sort of, I respect the house when I'm there. I, I never challenge Aikido form or Aikido principles. And I just try to contribute something that people can use. Uh, so just with that as a sort of context, um, one of the dilemmas, which I think you just outlined is the way Aikido envisions physical conflict is sometimes very hard for people to understand. Yeah. Uh, that you're asked to do things in the uke role uh, that your reptilian brain is saying, no, why would I do that? Okay. Um, and honestly, I think one of the real dilemmas is something is left out of that basic training. Mm. And part of it is Weishiba's fault. Part of it isn't. But what it is is, before you start doing um, techniques with another person, there should have been and should be very intense and rigorous solo training. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think one of the things that's interesting is Weishiba taught different solo training regimen in different Aikido centers. I think that makes a problem for people but it's an interesting problem. I think that Oeshiba used different centers as kind of crash test dummies, where he said, I'd like to really emphasize these principles at Iwama or in Aomori or um, just this one teacher, I'm going to send him wherever he goes and he's going to get it differently. Mm -hmm. Right. But there were these basic training regimens. And if you see films of Ueshiba, you know, he started class with some at minimum Funakogo Undo and, you know, some other exercises, but people saw it as warm ups. And okay, we'll get through the warm ups. They sort of walk their way through it. And then, then we start doing Aikido. And I really had my first revelation of that. I, I, I trained briefly right before he died with a, a really well known Bagua Singhi teacher named Wang Shu Qing. Uh, and I would always come to the temple where he was teaching a little bit early. And he was always doing these very simple solo exercises. And I would follow along, but I'd be, oh, when am I going to learn? He was teaching Tai Chi and, and singing. When am I going to learn mm -hmm. that? Okay. Uh, when the group comes, he'll stop doing those exercises. Mm -hmm. Well, Wang was famous for this unbelievable level of power that he had mm -hmm. and the remarkable ability to absorb blows. It was years later I learned that he used to do those solo exercises four to six hours a day. Wow. 
Similarly, I was talking with a, a high-ranking practitioner of Yagyu Shinganyu, which is a martial art that Ueshiba studied for a few years before he got into Daitoju. He didn't get that far, but he trained in some Yagyu Shinganyu. And Yagyu Shinganyu has these absolutely brilliant five Kenjutsu forms. They're two-person forms mm -hmm. with very heavy boken where they smash into each other. And there's this kind of pushing back and forth with a lot of power. And they've always fascinated me. And I was talking to a Shihan of that school. And I mentioned my fascination. And he said, oh, yeah, those forms, the, the teachers say that they were passed down as a way of developing internal strength. And that you would develop a kind of intrinsic power that you would have postural stability no matter how somebody smashed into you. And they said you needed to practice this an hour a day. Mm. And I said, well, how long do you do? And he said, five minutes. <laughs> and, and so at least it was explicit there with Aikido, Ueshiba would be doing these things and just, I think, made an assumption. Well, if you're really paying attention, maybe on your own, you'll do these exercises. Mm. So it's almost like the basic of the basic somehow got dropped from most people's Aikido regimen. And, and, and so without creating call it the Aiki body, something that's referred to sometimes in Daikido. Totally. Totally, yeah. Without creating an Aiki body, how can you then go to those higher levels? Yeah, I agree. I don't think you, I mean, you can't, you might be able to perform the practices and techniques or whatever the, the skills from those levels, but it won't be actually from that level. It'll be from still from in, the Aiki body, so-called Aiki body. See, I see it as it's kind of a donut. Like I, everybody who walks into Aikido is like a donut with, with a form on the outside, but a hole in the middle. And this kind of this tanrin, these mm -hmm. practices where we internalize the, we gradually, systematically, slowly over a period of time, um, uh, you know, sharpening our swords against each other, so to speak, we gradually begin to internalize the forms until, uh, I love that you mentioned Aikibari, until we have uh, developed some type of Aikibari. And whatever that is, yeah, and again, I'm not I'm not defining what that is, but I think that that is the completion, or that is the, the complete process of the shoe stage. That until mm -hmm. the forms are internalized, we don't really have the foundation. We might be able to do the practices and exercises in the body of uh, the body of techniques that are up in the higher stages, but we won't really able be able to express them until we've kind of internalized this first stage. So beautifully conforming to the kata and, and not just conforming, but internalizing. Yeah. You, you know, it's, uh, I don't know how many people listening are uh, all that cognizant of different Aikido factions or whatever. I don't know who's joined, but um, when most people think of Saito Morihiro, the first thing that comes to mind is not subtlety. Yeah. Kihon and, yeah. Right. Not only Kihon Waza, but um, strength. This massive mm -hmm. uh, force of nature that, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so one of the most interesting things that I heard one day was a fellow, Jay Dunkelman. I don't know if you're here, Jay, if you're high. Um, Jay trained uh, with Chiba Kazo and now is one of the teachers at Kuomori Dojo in Tokyo, the first dojo I trained in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, Jay talked about visiting Iwama and how, Saito sensei said, grab my wrist as Aikido people are wont to do. And he said, the thing that was so remarkable was not, wow, Saito sensei is powerful. He said he felt like he was on roller skates on ice. Saito he, sensei. So, so, totally. the, no, totally. J, yeah. that, he that, was on roller that, skates on ice. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that Saito sensei was hardly moving and Jay was slipping from one side to another. Mm -hmm. And he didn't know how it was happening. And, you know, that was his abiding impression, you know, of, of, of this, this technique. And so the product of that rigorous training should be a level of subtlety and refinement. I agree. The question is, without the proper basic training, we aren't going to get there. And so I, I, think, I think in terms of the shoe level, there has to be, particularly for people who are in a teaching position now, some questioning. If, if, they've told a if somebody's told a remarkable story about your teacher, 
why are you not able to do what your teacher could allegedly do? What is missing in your own training? Because I bet you, you may have trained more hours than your teacher in his formative stages. That's a good chance, yeah. Right? Um, how, what is missing? And trying to figure out what is missing is to really start to achieve that shoe stage, the basic stage. Mm. You know, there, I, I, I'm, you know, that since you mentioned cytosine, because that's that's my background. I, I lived in Iwama for eight years, and I trained pretty much twenty hours a week. You know, for for eight years, and and um, the shoe state, cytosine's main emphasis was Kihon Waza. Now we did have advanced techniques as well, but the, that was mostly emphasizing on Kihon Waza. You get very grounded, very centered, very good with extension, very powerful. You get arms like you know, like an ox. And um, now he was free. He was a beautiful living expression of Shuhari. He could just do everything, you know, in the middle of a, a big Kagami Biraki, the dojo was about a hundred square meters packed all the time with training. And you had to learn how to do high falls within that kind of environment, like in a phone booth. But in the middle of a big Kagami Biraki celebration, there might be 200 people inside of their, you know, inside of the dojo. And he would, he would be drunk as is want to be in Japan, you know, during these celebrations, he would call somebody, call me up and just demonstrate a technique. And, you know, next thing I know, I'm flying through the air and there's just a little space to fall. You have to learn how to fall in a little space where you're standing. And as I'm floating through air, he's, I, I just kind of see him walking back to his table and, and continue to talking, telling his, his, uh, his friends what he was trying, the point he was trying to make. He was a living expression of Shuhari. However, his teaching didactic was mostly shu and ha. And if anything, and, I, and this is my style I'm talking about, so I'm not, I'm not really, I'm kind of post Iwama, you know, it's in me, but I've kind of, it's included in me, but I've, I've, I've gone beyond it in my own way. Um, there can be a fixation in that style because of the emphasis on preservation of Osensei's technique. And that literally is the party line. And then it gets to the point where it becomes dogmatic. And if anything, I would see people get fixated or their, their development become arrested at the shoe stage at the best, the hot stage. Not everybody, many, many people do go beyond that, but there is a tendency for that. And I think it's, it was in the, a bit of the didactic. And Ellis, I think the reason he taught that way is kind of a historical thing. He felt he was, you know, it was his thing. He felt that his, what he, what he had learned from most and say, what was being done in Iwama was being lost. So he really felt he had to preserve that. But I think it had, well, actually my experience is that it had, it did have a bit of a developmental fixation. Well, you know, it's an interesting question though. Because I think many people, when they hear this formulation, imagine that at the uh, top stage, uh, well, I'll be doing a combination of capoeira, savat, aikido, <laughs> and MMA at random, you know, and, and, and plus inspirations from the gods. And, yeah. you know, and if you look at a lot of koryu, the gokui, is Gokui, for those of you who are familiar with the deep teaching or the final teaching, is in some sense the first thing you learn. Hmm. So, for example, in Todahabu Koryu, which is a, a, one of my schools, and Todahabu Koryu is known as a Naginata school. And you learn techniques of increasing sophistication so that at what was considered to be the highest level, there's a specialized weapon called a Kagitsuki Naginata. So it's a Naginata that's got a crossbar on it. Mm -hmm. And the crossbar was made of soft iron or bronze. And so what happens is if you cut at me with a, a blade, I thrust that forward and your blade bites into that crossbar and I twist it, right. it snaps the blade, right? And the, so its techniques are as fast and subtle as a sewing machine needle. Uh, it's brilliant stuff. Then you get up to the highest level and the highest techniques may have been the first techniques of the school. I'm still doing research on that. They are all named for gods and dragons and things like that. And they're with the Nagamaki. The Nagamaki is a giant halberd, a giant Naginata. Mm. And so you finish with all the subtlety and then it's at the end of the day, you have to be able to, smash through your opponent's defenses and crush them and cleave them from top to bottom without impediment. What's interesting is when we started Todabukoryu, we were doing solo cuts. We were doing a lot of suburi. We were doing mm. some very basic 
movements. There was a very specific uh, regimen that we were expected to learn. And in the end, we end up with an application of those basic techniques using a, a weapon that requires a well-trained body even to maneuver it. Uh, I can think of many other schools where um, uh, you mentioned this from complexity to simplicity, mm -hmm. that the freedom actually comes not by um, uh, this incredible complexity. It comes through a true mastery of simplicity. The transcendent phase may not be, oh, I'm an improvisational master who, you know, every time I do a technique, it blossoms in a thousand blooms. It's, I can use the basic techniques with absolute freedom, the, pro the appropriate and perfect technique for that fraction of time when only that movement is the proper movement in right. that fractional moment. And that would be a def that would be one of the, 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 the hallmarks of re of re. Yes. Yes. It's, As opposed to it's evoked by the situation and it's yeah. per perfectly appropriate for that situation. Right. So rather than, so I think some people imagine uh, it's more like jazz that you start with a basic theme right. and you get to, uh, you, you, you get to the D stage where you're, you know, Ornette Coleman, uh, the thing is, you can tell the difference between an improvisational master of jazz and a person who didn't do their basics and is yeah. doing a legend improvisation. Right. The second is so shallow and empty and has, totally. yeah, yeah. And but the, that's the, but the definite for me the, again. It's per totally me. The perfect of shallow. The 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 um. What makes something shallow and empty is that it's not internalized. It is literally empty, like like you know, like a stuffed animal. You know, you shoot a bear, you take out all the guts, and then you stuff it. It's a bear, but it's empty. Whereas a living bear is actually a living bear. Not to not to suggest we should shoot bears, but but it, it quite literally, it's like you know, taxidermy has been done, and it's just holding on to the form. Or sorry, mm -hmm. uh, uh, preserving the the empty form. Maybe we should let. So let's go from shoe, which is before we get the re. So mm -hmm. we create the, we we talk about this foundation of shoe. And then what would be for you moving into ha? Okay, so let's look at it from a classical standpoint. Okay. Um, man, many people have this idea that code you from start to finish are um, rote repetition of forms, and that's all you do. It is true that some code you, which I consider living dead, are just that, right? But what should happen is this, and if you forgive me, let me sort of break down a couple of things. Um, first of all, in classic education, Uke was the senior or the teacher. Mm -hmm. Whereas one thing you see in Aikido is teacher gets up, throws people and, you know, stop taking Ukemi very, very early, right? Mm -hmm. there, there are a few who continue, but most don't really do that very much, right? So if I am teaching somebody, I'm going to be in the UK role. People are going to apply techniques to me. When And my job is to be at the leading edge of the best they can be. So I challenge them at their limit. And I don't. it could be their emotional limit, their physical limit, uh, their technical limit. I want to be at that edge so they can't relax. So um, they get better. If I am truly a teacher, what I do is I keep advancing ahead of them. Yeah. Right. Which also means that I'm still learning too and all that kind of right, stuff yeah. as opposed to you're, I've you're arrived. Learning, and You're even learning more. <laughs> right. You know, I, 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 I tell my students, you know, that uh, I'm still getting better. <laughs> you can't catch up to me yet. Right. You know, <laughs> unless, unless we have to run and then they went because um, uh, I can't run. But <laughs> But also what begins to happen is I may break the kata because right. when you have a kata set of like say eight kata, they should be, that set is really, there's one meta kata. And in, within that set are all the alternative possibilities of that configuration. So let's say um, 
It's uh, um, Naginata against Naginata. It doesn't mean in this set uh, is every Naginata technique and every Naginata school across Japan. That's not necessary. But it's if in one kata, if you attack low, I'm given an option. One kata, you attack high, I'm given an option. Right. Now, when we get to the ha state, the first level of that would be you're thinking we're in kata number one. I attack low instead of high. What do you do? Do you tell me <laughs> you're not doing the kata? If you do, you're stuck at shoe if you say that. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, you adapt. Yeah. And, and so, and, and the adaptation, if the kata lives in you, will be spontaneous. And literally you would, for example, the first level would be shifting from kata number one to kata number four, mm. right? And now you're doing kata number four together. The next level might be, it goes somewhere else because although the teacher attacked low in number four, somehow that evoked kata number 11 in the set. And so you end up attacking the teacher. Now, of course the teacher should also, or the senior should also be able to go back and forth while maintaining the basic principles of your art. So one flaw that people have is they want live training and they start sparring too soon. Right. And, and if you spar too soon without the basics, you'll fall back on your reflexes of self-preservation. So when I first started martial arts, uh, I was training in a school, it was an offshoot of a guy named Alan Lee, who was one of the first Chinese to teach non-Chinese uh, uh, Kung Fu in, in America. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we did sparring sort of Kyokushin Kai rules. Could kick to the head as hard as you want. Uh, no, no protective equipment. Uh, punches were neck and below the neck. And it's scary. We we're just learning some forms. So basically when we start sparring, most of the guys, it was a, uh, it was a downtown uh, African-American school. So most of the guys had boxing experience. So people would just go into boxing, right? Nobody was learning the thing that they came to learn. Right there. So there's this problem. It's a trap in some sense. You have to learn the form. The form better be good because you may have ingrained in yourself non-survival based movements. There's that dilemma on the other side. Right. 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 But nonetheless, in, in, what will happen in Koryu is in a living school, you begin challenging the kata in various ways. Uh, I can put, I can just put more physical pressure on somebody. Somebody can get uh, accustomed to a certain level of impact. What happens if I triple the impact, right? Uh, what happens if, as I, I said, we began to change the form? What happens if uh, we do a semi freestyle in which one person is required to only use one technique to defend themselves or two techniques the other person is free to attack. And so there's uh, this, in a sense, there's a formalized structure in true kata training for breaking the kata. Right. Yeah. And it's beautiful. What you said, what happens if, is really the entirety of the ha phase for me. Is that mm -hmm. you can't really do that as a beginner. If a beginner comes in and says, what happens if, then you, you put them back into conformity. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of, they're not ready for that. But once they've become fluent in the basic forms, so-called master or internalize the basic forms, understand all of the variations of those forms and in a way categorize them internally, not, not necessarily intellectually, but internal, internally from simple to complex, then playing the what happens if is a very rich and juicy practice. Great. And the thing is, I think that a red-blooded person, that has to be shown to them in some way. Um, yeah. So yeah, if I sure. can tell a story, and I, I'm not telling the story to brag or anything like that, yeah. it's, it's, it's a good objective. And uh, this one dojo I was teaching uh, in Spain, um, I was teaching Todaha Bukodium, and uh, a fellow came in, and he came in largely because he'd seen some of my books and thought I must be good because I wrote a book. Um, I'm being a little cavalier about it, but anyway, so I had this kind of revelation, uh, a reputation 
So he came in to join the school and he came from a, uh, an organization that was similar to the Dog Brothers. And if anybody knows the Dog Brothers, uh, higher consciousness through harder blows. They, uh, they have these kind of open, okay. uh, it was originally Filipino martial art based. They wear very light protection, a, a fencing mask and with little gloves with, uh, it's great. with sticks. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, other things too, mm-hmm. because it's now a person can bring in a Chinese spear, you know, and that's what you, you train or whatever. Right. And so he had that background and also a, a good MMA background. And so he was shocked that this martial art by the incredible Ellis Amder uh, was only doing kata. And so you, I could just see how miserable he felt. You know, it's like, wow, there's a dream of something good that just got pissed away. <laughs> and um, so there were a couple uh, Fukuro Shinai, for those who don't know, it's a leather encased uh, split bamboo sword on the wall of this dojo. And so I gave him one. And I had been talking about a particular usage of the body. Some people call internal strength and we're, we're doing some training methods for that. And I could see him rolling his eyes. And uh, so I said, okay, attack me any way you want. And I said, I'm just going to organize myself the way I, I would usually before I did this training. And I'm going to sincerely try to beat you. He was younger than me. He was faster than me. And he was hitting me and I could see his heart breaking all that much more. And um, then I said, okay, okay, now let's do one more. And I said, I'm going to have my sword above my head. And I promise you, I'm going to hit you in the head. It's going to come just like this. Do anything you want. And I hit him. And then he said, what? And, and, and so I started doing it at will. And I started doing it well because it was a product of the training we're talking about. Mm-hmm. He knew it was coming, but there were no tells when I would move. And again, I'm, I, I'll be real clear. I'm not saying this to brag. Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to illustrate what I tried to, I then illustrated to him. I said, what I'm doing now is a product of what the training is in this dojo. This is how I learned to do it. And then, you know, we had a a good student. Um, So I think it is fair that a student should, in one way or another, question when the teacher is offering the basics, well, there's got to be some kind of proof. Now, when I joined Toda Habukoryu, my teacher was five feet tall, 110 pound, 60 year old plus Japanese woman. I did not have the slightest inclination to challenge her. Uh, It wasn't. I could see from her movement that she had a kind of knowledge that I didn't possess and that was sufficient, but it is quite reasonable for any student when asked to put themselves in a box, that shoe form, there has to be some evidence that this is a good thing for them to do. But then if you will, the liberation in that next phase is, can I stick a limb out of the box and do something with what you've confined me into. Has it become exactly uh, the term? Exactly. The term I use is a, it's a pseudo instinct. You've replaced perfect, perfect. You, you know basic protective reflex with a movement that you weren't born with. You were born with a capacity for it, but you weren't born with it. But you can now use it spontaneously in response to certain stimuli. You can certainly start. Uh, practicing to use it spontaneously and when it doesn't work mm-hmm. then you 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 because I, I see the hot stage is we have one foot in form and like like stably solidly solidly we've developed solid solidly we've developed our, our our that that part and we're starting to step out into the unknown into this freedom to the spontaneous and and this and that's the application the the oyo was the, the applying what we've learned to different situations you said i don't remember what you said but the, you know we go from the dojo to the stairs to the beach to the mountains to one person to two persons with a stick with a with the cup with a with a remote with a bottle whatever it is and we start to apply what we've learned in new situations, we make mistakes, we go back to basics, we, we step out again, we go back to basics, and that stepping out, it's like a whole new learning cycle that we've entered into. And through that, we start to develop, um, uh, from the, with the complexity, we start to apply that in a way multidimensionally. 
Yeah, I think you've raised a really good point that a lot of people when they hear shu how do you think of it as steps? You attain a step. It's an oscillation yeah. that you are. Yes. yes. You never leave the basic form. Uh, mm -hmm. You are oscillating within a level of adaptability. Um, then you go back again uh, to the basics. Um, uh, you know, the one formulation similar to this that O Sensei used was uh, Ken Yu Shin. Ken and, Yu Shin, what's that? Right. So Ken uh, was, is, is manifest. Uh, I, I mentioned the hidden plane oh, site. Sure. Yeah. 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 And this was in Shirata Sensei's Aikido, he, he passed this down to his students. Um, so right. Ken is manifest. Um, you is uh, hidden, hidden and Shin is Kami divine. Uh, or uh, divine. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in the way should be because of his um, kind of everything was also, also religious. It wasn't one or the other. So Ken was this world and it was also Yomi. It was the, the underworld, uh, the, the, the world of hell at the same time. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and, and that's where uh, you did your shugyo. Uh, oh, right, the purification. So just, right, right. So, so um, uh, that's exactly it. You know, in, uh, in Hidden Plain Sight, my one chapter, Aikido's Three mm -hmm. Peaches, where um, uh, divine being goes down to hell to rescue his wife, who is now a hag of hell. And geez, that was a mistake. And now I got to get out. Um, and this process of um, returning to the world but going to hell and doing purification rituals step by step to get back out. So that misogi was performed in the manifest mundane world, that the purpose of Aikido was a kind of purification, but it required righteous technique for it to be an authentic ritual. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see, you know, People have whatever quibbles they have um, regarding Ueshu Bumurihe based on all kinds of things. Uh, right. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. that aren't necessarily connected to who Morise Ueshu was. Right. And, you know, I, I don't deify him. Otherwise, I wouldn't sure. wrote a book called Dueling with O Sensei. Um, I can see some flaws and things that he did technically. Uh, and, and he was human. He had, weapons. And he yeah. had human shortcomings. Right. But um, there was, as far as I could see, there was not a separation. Oh, now we're doing Kamiwaza. It's got nothing to do with martial arts. Or now we're doing martial arts. It's got nothing to do with um, Kamiwaza. Now, if a person has a Judeo-Christian perspective, they're saying, oh, you're doing something spiritual. That must mean you're talking morality. And it's, it's not morality in the sense that people would like to think that spirituality not is. Yeah, not necessarily yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but at any rate, uh, I think that in terms of Aikido, there was one aspect of Ueshiba that he saw any Aikido practitioner as lending themselves to the great work of a purification of everything. The universe, and right. so if you, if you were stuck in basic technique, if you were Tomiki Sensei doing a competition model, remember, Ueshiba called for Tomiki on his deathbed. If he was so anathema, why would he call for him, right? Um, right. Everybody was part of the great work. And if somebody perceived a kind of higher level of what he was doing, that was part of the great work as well. If they divorced themselves from martial arts things and were only doing spiritual stuff, to a certain level, he might be tall under that, but there's the one thing. When he would go running into the dojo and say, that's not my Aikido. And what he was basically saying is, for something to be misogi, it had to have virtue, had to have march martial virtue. Right. So that's that oscillation. Yeah, you can take your flight, but if you don't have the basics, you can't go to ha without that shoe, right? Beautiful. Beautiful. Hey, Ellis, I, I just need to ask you, your finger's a little bit in front of the camera. Oh, it is. Yeah, and yeah. You can't see nice your beautiful face, so. Yeah. yeah. What, and I do want to, let's see, we have about 
well, we, we, we have about another 10 minutes before we open up the mics to ask questions um, and to allow questions. But um, I did want to, so what you were just talking about, Osensei, in a way, is similar to what you were saying before. He could meet people where they're, they were, wherever they were at, he would meet them there. But ideally, he wouldn't leave them there. So you meet them where they're at, but you don't leave them where they're at. You give them a little bit more to stretch themselves, you know, like like a like mm-hmm. a, you know, a father or a mother more more often or not. The father, as a baby falls down, he goes, daddy, daddy, the daddy might, you know, scoop them up. But just with kind of this kind of masculine compassion withholds a little bit the grip. So the baby has to stretch a little bit. So that's kind of the the teacher's role in wherever they're you, the people you're working at in the shuhari. You meet them where you're at, but you encourage them to to grow into the next wh- whatever station they can grow into, or capacity, or uh, whatever their the next osmosis may be. So since this is we're getting towards the end, before we open up the the, the mics for questions, um, let's shift to the okay. The, 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 hidden, um, the divine. So here's what's interesting. In a, in a classical codium, there was literally a gateway to D, and that was initiation into the Gokui. Right. And so there was literally a, a, a possibility that when you learn the Gokui techniques, this would enable you to understand the lived experience of the people who created the school all the way down. In other words, the school doesn't become a set of techniques. It becomes you. Yeah, and I become Arakidu. And you become a living transmission of a lineage. Yes. And that's not just some uh, uh, a flowery uh, statement. Literally, you have experiences that enable you to assimilate the school. Now, once you assimilate the school, because you preserve yourself, now there's, you are simultaneously embodying the school and able to transcend. Right. There's another aspect that some of the classic code you had teachings like uh, Tengu show. Uh, Tengu show, the Tengu were these mountain elementals. Sure. And this was what they, some, there were rituals in which you can essentially willfully be possessed by Tengu. Hmm. And this is, in a sense, absorbing the uncertainty principle as part of who you are. That certain actions you say, that wasn't me. And you know, I've had to give two, one disparate example, you know, writing with fiction. Um, I don't have notes and, and, and plot out my novel. I just sort of have thoughts drifting in my head. And literally I will sit down at the keyboard and ask, say, gosh, I wonder what's going to happen tonight. And then I just put my fingers on the keyboard and I start typing. And it flows. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's sometimes, and there's part of me go, wow, really? Oh my gosh, I hope they get out of this one, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> so, um, we, and, and again, here's where are we doing, can we get to the D level in Aikido when Ueshiba specifically was doing these Chinkon Kishin rituals, which are rituals of possession. Mm. And that was part of him. Now, some people could say from a Daitoidu perspective, well, most of what we see of physical actions that Ueshiba did or hear about, um, Daitoidu people who weren't practicing things like Chinkon Kishin were doing too. And that's, that's a fair critique. Yeah. Although I think there was, this could get to be a very complex subject with a few minutes. So I'm not thinking about Ueshiba's um, Shihonage right now. Uh, so at the D level, that encompasses his attempt to uh, embody certain phys- spiritual principles in physical action and mm-hmm. pass those on to other people to enable people to experience those things. Um, so one dilemma, I think, for Aikidoka, as opposed to a kodyu that is genuinely still alive from beginning to end, is the kodyu actually had a kata, if you will, to transcend. 
Now, could that become sterile? Sure. Sure. Could that become rote? Absolutely. Yeah, it, so it sounds like a contradiction in terms in a way. Yeah, but everything interesting is. <laughs> okay, I love it. So, so explain that. Then how is it, a con how is it um, what, what's the paradox well, there? Well, the paradox is I could teach, I could pronounce right here on the internet some uh, Gokui, and you go, yeah, but without all those levels. So here's, here's an example. Right. One Gokui I was informed of in Jigenyu uh, is dragonfly on a post. And you say, oh, it's poetic. So if you ever watch a dragonfly on a post, it all of a sudden flies away, back, and it flies away. And each time it flies away, it flies to a different space. One time it's 10 centimeters, one time it's 20. Yeah, and, it's, in a way. and so this is like a profound teaching of my, yeah. that if I have a target without hesitation, I will reach that target with all of me without mm -hmm. any hesitation. Now, you can hear that and you go, cool. But what the Jigenyu people do is they practice for many years, their primary practice is not their only practice, but their primary practice is striking a tree. Yeah, got it. I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And so when, so, and, and this can still have that lightning bolt effect, even if you've already heard the Gokui, if you've done the Shugyo. Mm. It's not like Zen that, oh my God, dragonfly on a post, it's all clear to me. That's not necessary. You might have heard it before, but when you hear it at the right timing and the right circumstances, it still smashes you between the eyes. Right, because the shoe mind can hear it, but not really get it. Even the ha mind yeah. can get it and or hear it and not necessarily get it. But when it's when when the mind is right, that's when it smashes you between the eyes, so to speak. Yeah, and the best teachers have got that impeccable timing of when to teach something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um. So. In that sense, the Gokui is like, well, it's a kata. It's in the text. You could, you, I'm, I'm sure there's Jigenyu Makimono floating around that's got it written down, you know. Uh, but it is, so in that sense, it's a kata. It's codified. But in the right time, in the right circumstances, it becomes a breakthrough that y y y y sort of opens up everything you've done to now. So in a sense, you're not transcending mortal existence. You're transcending the limits that you believed were there within the art form you're doing. Right. Right. And the result is not chaos. Exactly. And it's not F and it's, and it's no effort either because, yeah. you know, in a way, shoe is a lot of effort because we're, you know, we're building and forging a, a form and system and a, we're internalizing and, and then we move into, and it, but it's simple. You know, it's, it's meant to be simple because that's, that's what people that walk into a, a school can, they can only take what's simple, then gradually it becomes more and more complex until we know all the variations and all the possibilities. And, and you know, we, we sharpen those up and we polish them, et cetera. And then when we reach the, the restage, it goes from simplicity to complexity to the second simplicity where it's, yeah. it, it's, it's kind of a, a spontaneous, it's a spontaneous manifestation of, of what's being evoked by reality. And, you know, one of the dilemma is the best gateways are symbolically rich. So that, um, so what do you mean by that? The best gate. So, for example, I saw a fair number of uh, uh, Takamara Shindo Yoshin Yoshinyu practitioners said yeah. hello. Um, so in Yoshinyu, there's this gokui, this metaphor of snow on a willow tree. And, you know, everybody hears that. and Oh, the yielding principle and all of that. But when you actually look, if you actually look at a snow laden willow tree and watch the way snow actually comes off of that tree, you know, it's bending down the limb and the, the limb does not flip it up. Usually it shrugs it off. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for, uh, for a practitioner of that to really then all of a sudden realize every one of the was that has been taught to me has the possibility of that shrug, powerful, tensile, you know, the, 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 the tension of a limb. Uh, it's not flexible in this sense, you know, this, this, this coiling 
inside the body and then you shrug off and use no more forces necessary right. to shrug yeah. off that force. Uh, that poetic image will take you far further than, well, you need to coil your body on the inside. Totally, and, yeah, totally, yeah. Right? I love it. And so, so one of the dilemma, um, I think one of the dilemma many Aikidoka have is some of the images don't work that well. Uh, they, they confuse people. Uh, they don't have a poetic resonance. So for example, I could, uh, I, the eye uh, uh, is love. And because of the character used, um, one thinks of romance or you try to say, oh, spiritual, agape or, 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 or whatever. And this wasn't unique to Ueshiba. This was a term floating around in different contexts, which is very culturally laden. Um, so it leads to two things. The one is one has to really investigate the metaphors and the poetic imagery that's given to figure right. out what the hell is being said. Yeah. So exercise right. the mind in a way, really stretch your capacity to understand. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's, I think it's worthwhile to look at Aikido to see if from beginning to end, if, if the metaphors that are used, and there were so many metaphors used at different times in different locale, it mm -hmm. makes it hard to sort of follow that step by step procedure to to D in 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 a way. Right. So okay, so we're gonna I'm gonna give you a metaphor here, but before we do that, I'm gonna, we're gonna make a transmission transmission. <laughs> Speaking of shitty, we're gonna make a transition and a transmission. Um, uh, I'm gonna I want I want to just make a couple of announcements. Uh, so it's a, a, a bit of a pause here, but then as we come back after Ellis kind of gives his reply to the next question. Uh, we're going to open up the mics for questions. So if anybody has questions, um, raise your hand, but not physically. Raise your hand electronically. I'm going to go down a list um, in, in the order that they're raised. If you don't know how to do that, go to the participants button, open it up, and there should be a little prompt on your right side of your screen to raise your hand if you have a question. And also I know uh, that George Ledyard Sensei is with us uh, on this call, so I'm going to bring him in at some point as well. So my announcements are basically about the rest of this series. So the Shuhari Dialogues, um, series is, um, uh, it's a series of five meetings and it may actually grow into more. We'll see. But, uh, the next meeting is going to be with George Ledger Sensei and that's in about 10 days from now, I guess, on, on Tuesday. In fact, the next three are going to be on Tuesdays. Um, the next one with George Ledger Sensei is on Tuesday, February 2nd. Similar time, but we're doing it one hour later. So wherever you're at. Um, uh, and then the one after that was going to be with, uh, Paul Manog Sensei. Uh, that'll be on February 9th. And then with Toby Threadgill Sensei, uh, Paul is, uh, uh, George Sensei does um, Aikido and Daikoryu Jiu Jitsu, mainly an Aikido teacher. And Paul Monog Sensei also does Aikido, but he does um, Edo Ryu Yagyu Ryu? Yagyu Shinkagyu. Yagyu, forgive me, Yagyu Shinkagyu Ryu. And uh, Toby Threadgill does uh, Shindo Ryu, Shin, uh, Todaha Shindo Ryu. And Toby's a, uh, no, no, no. No, okay. Takumara Hashindo Yoshindo. Takumara Hashindo Yoshindo. Thank you. Toby's an old friend of mine. We started, you know, he we we met in in back in the early days in Aikido back in Dallas. So he did a little bit of Aikido too, but that's not really his thing. And um, on the Sunday, the February twenty eighth, we're going to be doing an all sensei panel discussion. So again, if you have any questions, please do raise your hand electronically, and I'll we'll go to the questions in a moment. Um, so what I wanted to, to, before we go to questions, uh, since I wanted to, in Zen, uh, there's a beautiful saying that for me totally um, uh, relates to Budo as well, especially Japanese martial arts. And the saying is, you swallow the whole fish, swallow the whole fish, and you spend the rest of your life spitting out the bones. So what does that mean to you in context of Koryu, Shuhari? Well, what it means to me is... Uh, in this method of teaching, you can't pick and choose. The assumption is you don't know what's worthwhile. And that may include your teacher's personality quirks and worse. Mm -hmm. um, it is this method of teaching truly, right? It's nice to talk about this pretty, but this method of teaching can be profoundly dangerous because uh, depending on who your teacher is and what his or her values are, you will absorb all kinds of things. Yeah. Um, you can't just say, I'm here for the waza. 
if you're following this model. You may get better at whatever it is you're interested in getting better at, no doubt about it. You may become expert at something. But this model is, I used the term earlier, you got to be infected. And oh, I've been spitting out the bones from for 30 years. Right. Um, I mentioned dreams, uh, you know, with particularly my one teacher, and there's a lot of bones to spit out. Uh, I don't need to go into details about all of that, but yeah, yeah. We I, all have, if we committed to a teacher, we all have a lot of bones to spit out. Yeah. Yeah. I absorb values that now I'm horrified by. Mm. Um, I took what I learned far beyond the dojo and felt right in doing so at the time. So, I mean, one has to understand that we can have this shuhari dialogue and it sounds real cool and stuff, but if one is actually living this, you do, it's a great metaphor. You do swallow the whole fish and some of them get yep. stuck in your throat and some of them may never get out and may screw never, you up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's a, there's a, there's a famous saying or a kind of well-known saying out of spiritual traditions that the shadow of the teacher will be multiplied in the students. Yeah. And, and as teachers, it is, it is so very important that we take this, um, that we, we take this whole kind of developmental path, um, uh, not just seriously, but but um, we can we, we can we have to consider deeply its ethical implications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's like uh, in many Buddhist traditions, they talk about the illusory nature of all reality and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And yet, in the Buddhist community, there are basic moral rules of behavior, and some people want to say, "Well, those are all illusory. Why can't I punch so and so or whatever?" Yeah, and. Essentially, you know, what you're being told is that you're in that ambiguity we referred to earlier. You got to hold both. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And without such, you can take the, uh, you can make the Darth Vader move where you, you gain power, but you kind of use it um, mm -hmm. for your benefit and maybe for the detriment of others. Yeah. Yeah. yeah beautiful. So, so we're going to take some questions. So far, only Roland has his hand up. If nobody else here has a question, I can't believe that. But um, if you do... I saw some people typed questions. That, that might be two. Uh, yeah, but the, thing, the problem is I'm going to have to go digging for them. Um, if you did put a question, uh, please cut and paste it again. And I'll, I'll read them off, the, uh, I'll read them off of the, uh, the, the chat. Otherwise, uh, in a way, I prefer it if you, if you jump in. Yeah. So let's go ahead and open it. Roland, can you open up your mic? Okay, thank you. Welcome. So I have actually had one question, but the last conversation raised another question for me. So if nobody else is coming, I go for two questions. All right, let's see. <laughs> the first question that came up is, Shuhari, is this primarily for the martial arts or is it, can you find it at other places in Japanese art, spiritual paths and so on? Yeah, great so, do you have any examples that could uh, seem, uh, could we could uh, uh, understand this m m bit better? Yeah, I do. But Ellis, why don't you take this one? You know, honestly, uh, as far as spiritual stuff in Japan goes, I'm really not very well educated. Uh, as far as um, uh, arts, this is a classic teaching model within different Japanese art forms. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact. It was probably imported into martial arts from things like take your pick pottery, uh, yeah. calligraphy, or what. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. May yeah, I go for yeah, yeah, well, just if I just said the one example I would give is in Shodo, they yeah. have two, two methods. There's two, they, I didn't study Shodo, but as I understand, there's a couple of general schools. One is you learn all of the basic strokes. Uh, sorry, Shoto is Japanese calligraphy with a brush, yeah. inking brush. Yeah. You learn all the basic strokes. So there's quite a bit of complexity you have to learn to before you're allowed to do kinonagari, kind of free flow calligraphy. And then there's another school where you just practice ichi. You just, with your brush, you draw one for yeah. years until you've perfected the one. <laughs> and then when your teacher thinks you've perfected that, then you're allowed to do kinonagari in you know, 10,000 different forms. So that would be a couple of different ways, but it is all shimari. Am I allowed to go for the second question? Yeah. You were very allowed because nobody else is raising their hand. So if anybody does want to jump yeah. in, uh, otherwise we're going to bring George in next. So uh, yeah, please. So that concerns the, the, the last part of your uh, discussion before the questions. So 
if we go bring these arts to the West, what should we do <laughs> on a pedagogical scale? You know, I, I have uh, the Shihan of, Nor of Norway. He's kind of said, we cannot do the Japanese way. <laughs> so he's trying to show another way. So do you have any okay. like, suggestions? Yeah. Um, so back in uh, over a thousand years ago, uh, there were the famous Kentoshi. And the Kentoshi were Japanese priests who were going over to China to learn uh, different forms of Chinese Buddhism. And uh, Kukai came back with Shingon Buddhism and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I said to my, one of my teachers, I said, so I bet you some of those guys never came back. What do you think happened to them? And he shrugged his shoulders and almost contemptuously said, just another Chinese priest. So if one has come either to a foreign country, say from a Japanese teacher coming to your country, or I've gone to Japan and come back, the, I think the real task is transmitting something absolutely true and pure in essence and adapting as necessary so that that true essence is conveyed. The problem goes back to this original thing, Shu Hadi, that if I'm a, uh, an amateur level or a trivial level person uh, and I'm going to transmit something, what, can I, am I competent to transmit something of value? Uh, one book I've written, uh, co-written, is called The Coordinator. Uh, and The Coordinator is training for police and for warfighters in communicating with people who will always be your enemy. And how do you communicate with people who are your enemy in a way that maintains tactical strength and is respectful at the same time? And managing high-risk, high-consequence uh, social interactions in an unfamiliar environment. And my, my co-writer is a cognitive scientist talking about different principles of communication. I took everything I wrote directly from Kodium. Mm. And it was, how do you manifest, manage yourself face-to-face -face with someone who hates you, who wants to kill you? Mm. And so this applied psychology was imbued in Kodium. So I wrote one book as I said, for warfighters, and I wrote a clone book called The Accord Agent, which is for people in business environments. So this is pure Kodium in a modern context. When I teach Kodium, I make sure that the essential principles are conveyed to my Greek students, my Bulgarian students, my Spanish students, my American students. And there's some differences in how I teach because I have to respond to their character, which can be somewhat different. So this is not easy, huh? No. Oh. No. So, so, uh, um, Roland, I, I could say a couple of things about this. That, that, you know, yeah. Remember, Shuhari is a classic traditional methodology, old school, mm. old school. We had it in the, in the student, uh, the teacher apprentice system. That was how, how knowledge was transmitted over time, really through, through contact with the teacher. Um, Shuhari was replaced with modern um, academic, uh, pedagog pedagogic uh, methodologies. And those were replaced in some places, in some ways with postmodern methodologies. And the way that I, and so, so in a way, it's something that's a little bit left to the past, but I think it still has tremendous value. The way that I, if we kind of integrate all of these, the way I look at it is that Shuhari, I'm learning the forms. And the best I can do when I'm learning with forms is I can relate. Now I'm speaking specifically for Aikido here, not for other arts. Um, I can relate to another person's forms. I know the forms, so I can relate to forms. In Ha, as I start to separate and apply, I learn applications. I can start to adapt and, and, and work with different situations with another person. It's kind of an adaptive practice. When I fully internalize V and, I, and, I, and I've got this art internalized in me and I actively practice connecting with the interior of the other, then I'm not, re I'm not, I'm not responding to their forms. I'm responding to their, in, their interior. And perhaps this is similar to what Ellis was just saying with facing somebody who's really, you know, somebody trying to do a technique on you is not the same as somebody who's trying to get your ass. It's a very different situation. 
And if you can stay calm, centered, connected, open, and online when somebody's trying to really, you know, when it's the real deal, then you can actually relate from an interiority rather than from just the forms. You know, if we don't get hijacked by fear, et cetera. So the hands are coming up. Um, let's see, Mike Hire. Yeah, thank you very much, Roland. Uh, let's go, let's open up Mike's, uh, Mike, is it Heller? Yeah, Mike. Tyler. Yeah, you had it right the Heller. first time. Thank yeah. you. Hey, Ellis, how are you? Hey, Mike. Hey, um, so you have had a lot of students, probably like many of the folks on here who have had decades of martial arts experience before they come to you maybe even a decade or so of, of Koru experience um, before they come to you. Um, do you um, change your application of, of, of Shu Hari in teaching them versus a student who maybe doesn't have as much experience? And if so, how? And what would you say to a student who has an extensive experience other than the, you know, stereotypical empty your cup in order to conform and, and to really adopt the shuhari in their own uh, practice and learning with you? Um, well, first of all, they're coming to learn from me. So there's a certain level, there's a certain level, I'm really not interested in what they know. Um, I'm interested in what they know for two reasons or a couple reasons. One, maybe I'll learn something or I'll see a vulnerability in my own art when they respond reflexively. Number two, what I usually see is how what they know is getting in the way of learning what I'm trying to teach them. Um, now, I developed another teaching model, which I call Taikyoku Arakiryu, which is where I go to establish martial arts groups and teach them a portion of Arakiryu that we collaboratively decide this is what they want to learn so they can integrate it in their art. Now I'm adapting what I know for them. And that's what I've been, if you will, contracted to do. At the same time, I don't water down what I'm doing at all. So I guess the main thing is when somebody comes to me with other experience, it's, I only notice it when that other experience creeps in and it's getting in the way of what they're trying to learn from me. That's the best way I could put it. Yeah. And this is what I was trying to get at is how do you, how do you get them to break that mold? You know, is how, you know, uh, do you have any, anything other than the just, Hey, you got to do it my way or not, or empty your cup or that, that sort of, do you have any, you know, anything that, that can really be kind of like that cosmic smack in the head to bounce them out of that thought pattern? Well, uh, on one level, I do a very specific smack on the head. Um, <laughs> the cosmic smack. <laughs> I, I, will, I will show them that what they're doing doesn't work, and I'm tired of it. That Against me, that doesn't work. You came here to learn from me, and I'll defeat you, so why bother? That's the one level. The second level is um, it's up to, it's on them. So let's say this, um, in empty handed grappling, I have people with BJJ black belts who come to train for me and empty handed grappling, they can defeat me very easily. The grappling I know is very different. It's with a weapon involved and it has a different aspect. So if I'm beaten, so to speak, if we're rolling around and I'm beaten, I'm like, that's cool. And I should learn more. That's really cool. Now you came to learn this. Here's the deficiency in what you just did. And if the person persists in not learning that, I would stop being interested in teaching them. Because I don't teach for money. I'm not a missionary. If every student walked away from me, I don't care. I, there's a human level I kind of care because I like the people I teach. But if they all said, you know, Ellis, we don't like what you're teaching. We're not interested. We all quit. Fine. That's not what I, my life is not wrapped up into teaching other people code you. And the idea is it only deserves to survive if there are people who find it of value to them. Right, right. 
That's great. Ellis, uh, listen, we're, we are coming close to our time. We got three more questions. Okay. Um, do, you, do you have time to go over a few minutes if it goes sure. over? I'm, okay. Absolutely. I'm open. All right, great. So let's go ahead and open up the next question from uh, Karsten, uh, Karsten Hemholtz. Karsten, where, where are you hey, calling hey. from today and what's your question? <laughs> hey, Karsten Hemholtz from Hamburg, Germany. I have, uh, it's not really a question, it's more a comment. Um, if we take Shuhari and the shoe stage as conforming to norm or conforming to specific form, it still doesn't answer the question of how a teacher gets a student to do that. Um, I'm getting, I came to that thought when I heard the question about teaching principles east versus west. Western students might tend to overthink stuff, might, ha might tend to have a more, I don't know, um, well, put, just put too much thought into stuff rather than just doing what the teacher tells you. And I was kind of interested in, in Alice's thoughts on, on how to get students to that shoe stage um, without over explaining and without explaining something that cannot be rationally explained until you have um, his or um, someone else's high level um, of technique and skill. Great, Ellis. Um, again, it sort of goes back to the last thing I said that I don't have a mission. I, I don't care on one level if people learn or don't learn from me. It's up to them to want to learn from me. And my job, if job is the right word, is to manifest in as pure and powerful a form what I know. And if another person is not drawn to that, is not fascinated by that, then they aren't going to pay attention. And if I'm cajoling, on some level, cajoling the person, oh, come on, no, it's better this way. Here's our form mm. or anything like that. I'm demeaning myself. Right. You know, if somebody, you know, you, you, Miles used the example of Pablo Picasso, mm. you know, it's like, I doubt very much that Picasso would have said, so, um, we need, you need to distort more on the arm, right? It's like, look, it's right here. Yeah. Pay attention. This if, you goes get to it, the, if you don't get it to face, then you don't get it to face. It's, it's your <laughs> problem. It's not his problem. Right. So it, real quick, it, it's along with the Shuhari principle is the steal the technique principle, which mm. is um, you are so passionately invested in learning the, this art or from this person that everything is important. There's an old Hasidic tale uh, where Rabbi Zusha, who is known as a holy fool, was asked why he kept walking half a night to appear at Rebbe Mendel's court and what brilliant things was he learning? And Zusha said, I just go there to watch him tie his shoes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these are cute kind of stories, but it actually is true that the responsibility for learning is the student's responsibility. The teacher's responsibility is simply to manifest what they know. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go to David Ross. David, can you open your mic? Or who are you? Or where, yeah. Where are you calling? From? Where are you? Where are you joining us from? We are from uh, Münster, from Germany. So actually, it's a question uh, for me. From uh, I'm uh, Gabi. So we Hi, are Gabi. running. Hi, Gabi. Uh, Hello, hi. Very nice. Uh, it's absolutely stimulating uh, discussion. So my question would be, uh, so where do you see the major uh, roadblocks to reach the different levels? So what, what hinders a student to mature from, from the first level to the second and third? And how do you think, you know, uh, the teacher instructor can help there if there's any help? Or do you think you know, the student, if stuck, has to unstuck himself or what, what are the things that might help him to, to progress? Gabi, great question. Awesome. Ellis, you want to? Okay. Um, well, something, the student can be stuck because of their own conception of who they are. Uh, I can't do this. I'm not this. I'm not that. So that kind of psychological issue, um, I'm not going to be doing therapy with a student. Uh, you know, it's like, don't tell me about your childhood. It's not, it's not the time or the place for that. It's my job to show where that limit is. The important thing is to show it physically. Now, if I am too intense in showing that, all I'll do is break the student. 
right? So if you will, the teacher has to be aware of the lim limitation and there's a kind of exploration there, but how do I demonstrate to the student that they can actually go through this block? How do I pressure them? In what way do I pressure them that most effectively proves to the student to their own astonishment, oh, I can do this after all. And so if you will, the, the, what this comes down to from a classical standpoint is this is ukemi. The teacher takes ukemi. Ukemi means receiving body. I need to receive what the student offers take it into myself and offer something back that best communicates mm. the dilemma that the student has to go through. Yeah, beautiful. I, I, I'll just add to that by saying not necessarily that, because I think there's blocks going into each stage and there's also fixations of going out of each stage. I'm just talking about the fixations for a moment. At the shoe stage, the shadow or the fixation of the shoe stage is an over adherence to a uh, dogmatic adherence and preservation of the forms. It has to, must be like dogmatically, dogmatically has to be this way. If, the, if that's great up to a certain point, but it becomes a limitation after a, a certain point has to be let go of to go to the next phase in ha the, uh, the block from, from evolving from there, I would say is, is, an over fascination with complexity. It's another variation, another variation, another variation, another variation. So what? The variations are actually endless. There really is no end to the variations. At some point, that also has to be let go of in order to enter into the restage. And restage can also have a shadow, which is um, not wanting to go back into the forms. It's like, no, I'm free of the forms and I'm, at the, I'm on the mountaintop and I'm just going to stay up here because it's all clear and it's simple and it's easy and, and you know, I just enjoy life. But from there, we have to go back down the mountain. We have to return to the marketplace. You have to go back to shoe. You may or may not choose to go back into the basic forms of your school, your style. That's, that's a personal choice. But you will go back into basics, especially if you're going to transmit that to somebody else. So I would say those yeah, are the three. Basics will be there at every stage. And I think even the higher you, 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 you reach, the more essential are the basics because they are the fundament where you, where you graduate and where you, where you mature. Yeah, and we didn't speak about it, but really, in, in a way, we're talking about you know, three linear stages, but it's really a cycle. You're, you're always cycling back around. There's micro cycles and there's macro cycles. Wouldn't you agree, uh, Ellis? Yeah, yeah. It's and it, it's like... If, if, for example, in the, the classical Japanese uh, concept of koryu, you know, you get menkyo kaiden and allegedly you've arrived at something. Um, it's a new cycle. Uh, a new I cycle. don't, I no longer, I no longer do technique the way my teacher did. Uh, there's tangible core differences because I continued to study passionately. Yeah. So, so yeah, it just, it does, it cycles through. Uh, it's really a refined cycle. So it's like, because you're a cycle, you're coming back to a point, but you have a different view because you have been in the other part of the cycle, coming back to the point where you, so to say, start again, looking at it new, fresh, maybe even. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, that's true, but I don't think of it in terms of an objective. Oh, I'm looking at it now and I see it differently. I'm embodying it differently. And honestly, right. this yeah. concept that we're talking about, I never think about myself. Um, it's just that I might notice, oh, I'm, I did that differently today. And, and it just keeps transmuting itself. In other words, I, I, it, it's, I don't find it so helpful for myself to think of myself as in different stages and going up to a stage and then back. It's a, that mm -hmm. itself is a teaching device, a mental device. Exactly, yeah. Great, Gabby. Thank you so much. Um, Fred Little had his hand up. He put it down. Fred, if you have a question, um, we're going to go a few minutes over. If you do, please, Ray, open your mic and um, and let's hear your question. Yeah. Well, you both kind of alluded to the question, which was to what extent is this a one-time, or to what extent in your experience is this a one-time historic process and to what extent is it a continuing process? And I've heard some teachers describe this in the form of an inward 
spiral and some describe it in the form of an outward spiral. And at that point, I wonder about controlling metaphors and Ellis alluded, alluded to this earlier. Um, at what point these controlling metaphors stop being useful and start being stumbling blocks themselves? Mm -hmm. um, take that? Yeah, uh, well, you can see when a metaphor stops being useful, you can see it in the results of how people use the metaphor. Um, so for example, in Arakiru, we have a sword kata called Nakka, which means falling blossom. That could easily take people astray. <laughs> Right? <laughs> yeah, the actual um, the actual blossom being envisioned is a camellia blossom, which when it is fully in bloom, suddenly drops off the tree without any hesitation right. while it is still at its peak. And so that has two meanings, right? The one meaning is um, you're ready to die at any second. It's just going to drop on you and there's nothing you can do about it, but you move forward. The second is technically that's how you use the sword in this technique uh, where you're in one state and you're in another, and there's no transition between. Now, if that kind of meaning got lost because the teacher no longer embodied it, then, then that, that, that teaching could be really um, distorted. So the same way the Shuhari metaphor, honestly, I see it as really distorted. I think Fred has an exact point because people say, okay, I'm at the hostage myself because I improvise my techniques. Oh, I've transcended the form, et cetera, where this emphasis that, in fact, um, it's using the Aiki metaphor. Um, I think it was a Daitoju phrase that there always has to be Aiki in Jujutsu, but there always has to be Jujutsu in Aiki Waza, right? So conceptually, if we think of this as stage, then the metaphor has now gotten in people's way. Yeah, it has limitations. Right. And yeah. if you see it as this oscillation, or another way of thinking it is interpenetrating, it, 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 each stage imbues the other two stages, so to speak, yeah. then it becomes more workable. But that's only workable if the teacher is embodying it. Because you can talk this stuff, obviously we are, but you have to be working with someone in the presence of someone who without saying a word is embodying just that. They are manifesting the basics. And at the right moment that they're free to embody that perfect action at every sort of second as it goes, right? In, in, in terms of the art itself, I'm not talking about perfection in terms of, you know, a saint or something like that. Great, yeah, thank you, Fred. Um, so we're coming to an end. I'd actually like to, uh, in, in our next meeting, uh, George Leonard Sensei is gonna be joining us. And he's on the call today. George, could you open up your mic? And um... Hi, everybody. Hey, George. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. Hi, Alice. I haven't seen you Hi, in ages. <laughs> um, my participation in this discussion is going to be interesting because um, I have, a, you know, a shallow, <laughs> a shallow familiarity with Koryu. Ellis was an early teacher of mine. Um, you know, I trained with him for a few years. Um, but my my great love has been Aikido. And, and so to the extent that I did training with various people, and I've done a lot of cross training, um, I think it was always clear to all the people I trained with that I was always going to be an Aikido guy dabbling in what they were doing. And Ellis, Ellis Sensei was extremely generous in allowing me to participate. And, uh, you know, I've had other teachers and, and you know, um, we do have a Daitoryu study group, which I participate in, but I am not a serious practitioner. And, and Howard Popkins Sensei knows that I'm not going to be a Daitoryu guy. So in a, I'm sitting here listening to concepts discussed by people who come from traditions that are highly organized traditions that have been passed on in a, in a way that is proven over hundreds of years. And 
I inherited, you know, to the extent that I could say I inherited, I, I inherited uh, the job of transmitting something from my teacher, who is Saotome Sensei. And Saotome Sensei, the way he learned was chaotic. He learned by doing, he learned by watching, he got very little explanation from the founder. And he turned around and trained us much the same way. So to, you know, I have a lot of thoughts about Shuhari, but I'm essentially taking a set of concepts that in a sense don't even really exist in Aikido in any kind of formulaic way. Right. I'm using these concepts to talk about how I view what I'm doing in Aikido. And I'm not even sure that that can be generalized out to Aikido in general, because the way I was trained by Satomi Sensei would be, if you wanted to find the exact opposite of how the Yoshinkan guys do things or the Tomiki guys do things, or even, you know, in, in terms of post-war Saito Sensei, I was trained the absolute opposite way. Mm. And one of my, my very earliest memories is Saotome Sensei looking, I, you know, I was a white belt and I had no clue about anything. I'm just doing it and I love it. But I hear Sensei look over at one of the Udansha and of course, senior people in those days were Shodans. And he looks at this person, he says, don't do it the way I do it. And I still remember that. I mean, it was this was back in the 70s. And I'm going, what? <laughs> he's, you're like the model. And he's tough. But that's the way we were trained. And if you mm -hmm. actually look at the people who managed to survive the process for 40 plus years, and Sensei has a bunch of seventh dons that, you know, have managed to be the last people standing. Um. None of them look like sensei. None of them look like each other. So how can you even talk about shuhari? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, I use the concepts a lot. And I talk about it to my students, but it's my interpretation of a set of concepts that articulate what I'm trying to do with my students. And that's yeah. kind of the yeah. limit, really. Yeah, but as are mine, but I still think there's a lot of validity. And I've heard your, I've, I've heard you speak a lot about things that I'm, and and I, I think that you have a lot of, uh, of depth and and experience to share with us. So, oh, well, I'm, I'm sure that I can get in trouble doing this <laughs> chat here easily. <laughs> Great. I'm sure that there'll be any number of people who end up pissed off at me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do our best. Before we wrap up, uh, Ellis is well known for his books on traditional Japanese martial arts as well as tactical communication, aggressive uh, and with aggressive and ill individuals. But he's also written on other other subjects. Uh, Ellis, would you like a, to, sh to say a few words about that? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I think the links will probably be up. My, my short writing, my more contemporary writing on martial arts is at a website called kogenbudo.org. And... Uh, In the chat box now, I just put it there. Okay. And yeah, so I've written a series of books on using really Aikido and Kodu principles in communication uh, on tactical communication with aggressive people, people suffering from mental illness. And uh, that's been a specialty of mine for a long time. Uh, so there've been books like that, books for hostage negotiators, et cetera. But the plug I wanna actually give is for my fiction. Um, so all, all those books are on edgeworkbooks.com, but uh, so I've, I've written a couple novels. The first is called The Girl with the Face of the Moon. And it's a love letter to the outcasts of Japan. Uh, the people who were not part of mainstream Japanese culture, uh, abalone divers, uh, blind masseuses, uh, hunters, the matagi, all these castes that were outcasts, literally. Uh, and it's set in a Meiji period um, fairy tale, somewhat horrifying story of a mother trying to recover her child from a kidnapping. Uh, and I just published a week ago a book called Lost Boy, which... Um, and Lost Boy is about, you know, I had a career for a while in child protection. For a number of years, I was uh, doing assessments in uh, uh, when abused children, there was some talk of reuniting them with their caregiver. And so I assessed the alleged caregivers, some of whom were very abusive. I assessed the children. And there were times when I would be sitting opposite someone and thinking, you know, if I were a moral person, I'd kill them right now. This person shouldn't be alive. And I didn't do that. Um, 
And one of the reasons I attributed that to is that I was brought up without wounded. Uh, my parents had their quirks and all that, but I was a relatively unwounded human. And it hit me one night, uh, what would have happened if I had been wounded? Same man, and had I been wounded, and if I'd acted on those impulses. And I wasn't so much interested in one of those drama like Death Wish. I was interested in what would happen if I kept a secret like that from my family? What would that do to my relationship with other people? And so from that, I uh, uh, developed a story that was based on real encounters that I had of a man who uh, was a war orphan who was in the same job I had. And so that's the book Lost Boy. Uh, and by the way, they have great fight scenes. And I do stealth um, uh, I put in stealth references to Japanese martial arts principles here and there. And so there's those two books and also Cimarronin, which was a graphic novel I wrote with Neil Stevenson, Charles Mann, and Mark Keppo, which is uh, set in the 16th century. And we just had a lot of fun. Uh, that, that book actually um, is being taught in a feminist literature course in a, an Irish university. Wow. Yeah, because we have a woman character who is her actions are not predicated on her relationships with men whatsoever. And just the last thing I'll say, um, the upcoming call is with George Leonard Sensei, Tuesday, February 2nd, followed by Paul Minogue Sensei, uh, February 9th, Toby Threadgill Sensei on February 16th, and the All Sensei panel discussion will be Sunday, February 28th. Ellis Sensei, any final words? Yeah, I, there may have been some questions that didn't get answered and, uh, there's a contact form on the koganbudo.org website. If you want to run a question by me directly, you're welcome to write to me, and I'll try to answer those as best I can. Great. Thank you very much, Sensei. It's been, it's been a very rich uh, dialogue, and thanks to everybody who joined. I appreciate it. And as I always say to my, my meditation group, may your practice continue to lead you forward, forever and always forward, in your own development of Shu. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sensei. Thank you.